Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Anthony Scaramucci, founder and managing partner of Skybridge, the Wall Street firm. Great to see you, Anthony. Great to be here. Thank you. And congratulations on everything you're doing. Thank you very much. So you're ready to dive right into presidential politics 2024? Okay, here's the question. How is it possible that Donald Trump won't win? I mean, he's leading in all the polls. Well, we have 12 months to go here-ish. And so let's just say that uh, every day in presidential politics is like 10 years. And so I can take you back to November of 2016. On October 7th, 2016, we had the Access Hollywood situation. I was on the campaign. People said he was finished. Reince Priebus told him to drop out of the race. Uh, two days later, he went to St. Louis and did quite well in that debate. And 30 days later, he won the election. So we have things changing very, very abruptly. If the election was held today, he probably would win the election. There's concern about President Biden's health, his age, the dexterity that he has now, the concerns about the war. People typically like change when they feel financial anxiety. And I think even though the economy is quite strong, most of the middle class and lower middle class feels financial anxiety. But it's not today. And so 12 months from now, I think the environment will change once again. Mr. Trump is under indictment. He has 91 of those. He is a uh, civil litigation going on right now that he's faced with. And I predict that this will chip away at him. And uh, my dad uh, started in the construction industry and had a great line about it. You hit the rock one time, doesn't break. 50 times, it doesn't break. All of a sudden, the 51st time, the rock breaks. But what broke the rock? Was it any one of those things or the last blow? And I don't think he's going to be able to withstand the pressure related to the documents, the top secret documents and the unfolding case and the facts of that case. I don't think he's going to be able to withstand the testimony of Mark Meadows, who was granted full immunity on the January 6th insurrection case. So those are my opinions. And he looks very weathered. He looks anxious when he's walking in and out of these courtrooms. And uh, he'll, he'll likely have to stay in the race because it's presenting him with some political power. But remember, a convicted felon or the potentiality of a convicted felon uh, going into November of 2024, I don't think the independents are going to be in love with that. Now, right. up against that, just let me finish this, this is important. Up against that is President Biden's age. And we are very sensitive in our society now about different things. And I don't want to be accused of ageism, but let's face it, you know, certain people in the NFL have to retire due to age. Other people have to retire in life due to age. And that is a very tough job, arguably the toughest job in the world. And one has to ask themselves the question at age 82, okay, is that the right job for an 82 year old man? So should the Democrats put someone else in, in that seat to run? I would see those two seats. If you were asking me my opinion, of course, they, would, they wouldn't want any advice from somebody like me, but, mm -hmm. but you have to look at this stuff empirically and meritocratically. And I think the president would be serving the country by stepping down uh, and selecting somebody or helping to select somebody that had similar policies to him, but was possibly younger and potentially more vigorous. And uh, I actually think the president's done a very good job, but I would recommend that. And, and, and listen, if we were running it together, uh, you and I, okay, and it, it, we, we would look at, let's say we're on the board of the United States, we would probably recommend the chief executive at, at, at some point to go into retirement and to select or help to select a successful. And you're saying the vice president as well, you would recommend that. Yes, now the problem, the problem with that is because she's an African-American woman, uh, it's very hard to say that because people are virtue signaling in the society now. Uh, but I'm just saying it based on the lack of success that she's had in the job, uh, they need to find somebody else. And so, you look, Condoleezza Rice, I think, was very competent. This is not a uh, racism call or a sexism call. Well, it's kind it's of just hard to based judge on, a vice president. Based on merit, isn't it? I based mean, on merit. I don't want, I don't I don't want to so. go down this route. I don't, I don't, I I don't mean, think so. I think that right. the... I think that certain vice presidents reek of competence. Joe Biden reeked of competence as a vice president. We can go back through the vice presidents. Remember, Franklin Roosevelt uh, changed vice presidents right. twice, uh, ended up with Harry Truman at a time when the country needed him. And I think we have to get back to that merit-based analysis as opposed to 
virtue signaling. Do you still talk to Donald Trump? The, the last time I talked to President Trump was April 19th, 2019. Called to yell at me. What? Okay. What uh, will politics... You know why he was yelling at me? No, why was he yelling at you? Because I wrote an op-ed in The Hill that the press is not the enemy of the people. And since I've been ridiculed in the press, I thought I had pretty good standing to say that. And the mm -hmm. press is one of the main reasons why we have such a great society. It, it checks the people in power, but it also teaches our youth about freedom of thought. And when you have freedom of thought in a society, you have great economic innovation and great societal advancement. And the countries that don't do that, they have to steal our ideas. And so the president didn't like that. He, he called on Easter Sunday. I thought he was calling to wish me a happy Easter, but he was calling to yell at me to remind me that the press, mm. which would include you, Andy, right, is an enough. enemy of the people. But I don't believe that. What will presidential politics look like after Donald Trump and Joe Biden? Well, that's a really good question. I think that the country is in sorely need of a transformational post-partisan leader, somebody that can help to try to bind the country back together. And so we'll know it when we see it. We don't have it right now. Um, we've got some lunacy on the left and lunacy on the right. And we have this sort of excessive tribalism that's hurting the national interest. But I think the general spirit of things is that we need somebody that's quite unifying. And let's just look at the registrants now, 40 plus percent of the people are registering as independents. The Republicans are a minority party now, 29% of the registrants. And so uh, I think it's gotta be different. Uh, if it continues on this path, I think it's, uh, it's gonna really hurt the country. So let's, I, I'm a hopeful aspirational guy. So let's hope it's different. Shifting gears, Sam Bankman Freed. I wanna ask you your take on where things stand with him in terms of him facing decades in prison. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? It does make sense to me if you get the, the level, remember he was convicted on all seven counts, and if you look at the sentencing diagram for all seven counts, uh, I think his max is like 110 years. Uh, that judge is not known for life sentences, and he's a young man, so could he get 20 to 30 years? I think that's very, very likely. Given is that the, fair? Given the magnitude of what he did. Is it fair? Uh, given the magnitude of what he did and comparing it to the Theranos situation with Elizabeth Holmes, I think it is fair. Um, I see this thing obviously somewhat personally because I had a personal relationship with Sam and his parents. Uh, I allowed him to buy 30% of my company. Uh, I liked and trusted him. I'm not one of these people to revise history. Um, I do believe he committed a fraud and I believe that he had malevolence and criminal intent from day one. I do believe that now looking at the body of evidence. So some people and some people in the press or people have written books that have defended him. I'm not somebody to defend him based on the evidence and based on the people I know that were cohorts with him that pled guilty prior to the trial. So if you look at all of the evidence, it probably is fair because unfortunately in our society, you have to set a deterrence for people. You have to remind people that they're not allowed to steal other people's money. Right. And if they elect to do that or they abuse the fiduciary responsibility that they have, they've got to pay the price for it. So yes, I think it's fair, but I am saddened by it on a number of different fronts because he hurt people and also he's a young guy and uh, he made very, very terrible mistakes and it cost him a, a good part of his adult life. Well, it costs you indirectly, right? Because Skybridge Very took, directly. A, took a big hit last year, lost a lot of AUM assets under management. Did. How is the firm doing now? Well, I mean, the good news for us is we're having, you know, probably our best year uh, since the existence of the firm. Uh, we were down 39% in one of our funds last year. We're up 65, 70-ish percent right now. Uh, having a very strong report. reports had you down more than that, right? They were reportedly down sixty percent or something. Sixty percent? No, thirty-nine. Okay. Yeah, no, that was a painful article. I think Bloomberg wrote a very painful article about us, which was very accurate. Um, but you know, listen, we're having a big, strong recovery year. We lost assets because we had bad performance. Some of it was Bitcoin. Uh, some of it was losing assets because we sold some of our business to Sam. Uh, it's been one of the more painful situations for me in my business career, but I'm an entrepreneur. And I think entrepreneurs have to have resilience, have to face the music when things are going poorly and be accountable for them. But the flip side is 
uh, the assets that we've held over the last 12 months have done quite well. And I think we're set up to have a good year in 2024. And so the people that stayed with us or added to their accounts or new people that came in, I think are very happy. Uh, but yeah, it was a it was a very rough year. Uh, but you know, Andy, you and I know each other a long time. It's going to take a lot to knock me out of the game. You know, we're going to need like a radiological bomb or something to go off. I'm here. I'm committed. I love what I do, and we'll 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 get through this period. Uh, but this has been a very very good year for Skybridge, despite some of the negativity. What is the strategy of the company right now? Where do you want to take it? So I, you know, it's three-part strategy. We have a, uh, a fund of funds business. Uh, we're about to make a strategic acquisition, which I think will help the company. Uh, I did that last time in the global financial crisis. I bought a uh, fund of funds from Citibank. Uh, and so we're about to do something strategic and I think will be transformational. We have a cryptocurrency part of our business. I'm obviously a big believer in the digital property space. Despite the near-term volatility, uh, we, we got there three years ahead of BlackRock. Uh, and I'm very proud to tell you that I'm Skybridge is the outside investor. We were the first outside investor in the BlackRock Bitcoin Trust. We expect that trust to eventually get ETF approval. And so I'm very excited about that. I think it'll be very good for the industry. And so we have a digital asset component to our business and new economy component. And then the third component to our business, which is going quite well, is something that you've been to, which is our SOL conferences. And so we've branched those conferences out into Abu Dhabi, Singapore. Uh, we're going to go to Hong Kong in 2024. Uh, we've got a, a very interesting conference that we're going to do contemporaneous to the Fed conference in Wyoming. That'll be sort of a cryptocurrency, Bitcoin-ish conference in Wyoming, contemporaneous to the Fed. Uh, so there's a lot of exciting things happening on the conference side. And of course, uh, uh, last year being a very difficult year as it related to the Federal Reserve and the rising of interest rates, the necessary rise in interest rates, I think they'll be more tempered in 24 and 25. So I, I, I like where we are. Let me ask you, speaking of interest rates and such, your take on the macro environment, interest rates, inflation, the economy, the stock market, what's your perspective? So let's start with interest rates. I think this is very important. This is uh, you know, the, the humbling of life. I think the market's life, the vagaries of life humble you over time. Uh, and we get a lot of things wrong, even the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve missized it in the beginning. They caught up. They've probably gone overboard a little. I think people will reflect back 20 years from now, probably say that. But I think they've generally done a very good job. And so um, you know, I think the inflation numbers will start to come down now as the supply chain is reconnected, the adoption of new technologies is always quite deflationary. And so we may not get back to the 2% trend line, but we'll start heading there and that'll be very good for asset prices. You and I both know that interest rates are the financial gravity of asset prices and so we'll get there. So I'm optimistic about the curve and I think that uh, we have to be concerned about the deficit, of course, uh, but I'm also optimistic about that. I think we can get that into control. So I'm not one of these deficit despairing people. Uh, overall economy is quite strong. Uh, we just put too much money into the system, frankly, during COVID and it's washing around in the system and uh, we're growing faster than China. If you look at the nominal GDP numbers, just imagine that. Uh, and so I'm, I'm bullish there. I think the thing that I'm concerned about is the political divide. Ultimately, if we stay this disconnected from each other and this tribal from each other, we're not going to fix these long-term secular problems that need fixing and, and need some renewal. If the economy is doing so well, Anthony, why isn't President Biden getting the credit? You were a former White House communications director. What do you think? You know, I consider myself a failed White House communications director, but I would say that there's three reasons why he's not getting the credit. I think uh, reason number one is that there's very big time middle class and lower middle class anxiety. And so disposable income is up, but it's not matching inflation for middle and lower income people. And so they have less disposable income because they're paying more at the pump or they're paying more for their food and their necessities. And so they're upset about that and they're anxious. Uh, and that's a good preponderance of the voter. Or the voter. Mm -hmm. Second reason, and people are not going to like me saying this, but this is empirical data, people are worried about his fitness for office at his age. 
They just are. If you ask them polling wise, they are. And I'll just point out to the Biden administration or the Biden campaign, that's not something it, that is fixable. It doesn't get better with time. In fact, if anything, it gets worse. And then the third thing, uh, which is uh, creating anxiety, are the wars. I'm not blaming those on the president. Remember, some things are situational that get personalized. And I think he's done arguably a very good job as it relates to Ukraine. And I think what he did in terms of going to Israel was a brilliant move that I applaud. And of course, I'm a big supporter of the state of Israel. But I do think that it creates anxiety for people. And they're wondering out loud in the next four-ish years, is he going to be the right guy to manage us through these global problems? You mentioned your time as a communications director yeah. at the White House failed, you said yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah what I'm, do you I'm think okay about with, the people who talk smack about you? You know, I'm okay with admitting my failures. You know, and, and people who, you know, the unit of measure, the Scaramucci's, yeah, 11 well, days that, and all I, that I, stuff. Listen, I, I listen, first of all, if you go into politics or you have a high profile personality, you got to expect the dings and bruises. You can't play in the NFL and not get a concussion. So if you're uh, you're at the White House, you get fired after 11 days, you have to face the music. If you have a Bitcoin position on that does poorly, you have to face the music. I guess I'm wondering if I get the Bitcoin position right, because I told people it was a five-year investment and we're in the second year. I'm wondering if there'll be any positive to come out of that. We'll have to see. But at the end of the day, my grandmother said something I think people should really listen to, especially in the age of social media. What other people think of you is none of your business. And so... I sort of enjoy it, you know, I mean, it's fine. It's not great, but it's fine. You know, I took some of the uh, editors of the New York Post who parodied me to Rayos uh, a few weeks back, and we had a good laugh about all of it. You know, when Steve Colbert invited me on, uh, my communications people told me, oh, you can't do it. You know, you'll, it'll be a massacre. I said, relax, I'm going to do it. I brought him a front stabbing knife from my restaurant. And we had a good conversation. He asked me how long I thought it was going to last in the White House. I said, well, look, longer, longer than a carton of milk in the refrigerator. I didn't think it was going to get blown out before the milk spoiled. But my message to people is don't take yourself that seriously. If you're going to be in a high profile position, own it. And one last point, I think this is mission critical. The young people have a lot of pressure on them, Andy, with social media. And if they learn that early in their lives, they'll be better for it. What about your personal ambitions, Anthony? What about, say, running for U.S. Senator from the state of New York, Chuck Schumer's seat, although he's only 72, so he's going to be there for another 20 years. Well, I'm thinking about you versus AOC. Chuck, by Chuck Grassley's definition, yeah. he'd probably be there for another 100. I mean, right. I think these guys got to give younger people a chance. You know, I'm, uh, I'm turning 60 in January, and uh, I, don't, I never had a political ambition. I was always a business person. Um, and just not that you need to know this, but I use the political connectivity because when I was at Goldman, my father was a blue collar worker. They hired me to go into high net worth acquisition of people. The only way I could get in there was through politics. I had never been inside a country club or anything like that. And I was a Republican because my dad's union was controlled by the Republican Party out in Nassau County. So I have no political ambition. I'm basically running for reelection in my marriage. You know, I'm trying to stay married and keep my kids healthy and functional. But we do need political reform. And so I will continue to be active. I'm trying to help Governor Christie right now stay on the debate stage and stay relevant in the campaign. You know, I still believe that there's a chance that President Trump will have to drop out because of the situation that he's facing. And so we're going to need some people in, in the mix. But it's not going to be me. I'm not running for office unless you're my campaign manager, okay? So you don't you, want to run against you. Me. Sign up for be my campaign manager. I'll reconsider everything. Okay. I'm just thinking I would love to see a debate with you and AOC sometime. Well, that I would do. Right. You know, I offered Steve Bannon money to debate me. He said no. If uh, Representative Cortez would like to debate me, I would love to debate her because, in the free marketplace, in the intellectual free marketplace of ideas, let's just expose the mutuality of the hypocrisy. Okay, there's hypocrisy on the right. And there's hypocrisy on the left, and we should be less focused on left and right and more focused on right or wrong. And so let's talk about it, and let's talk about it openly. And honestly, I think most Americans, if they understand the issues, uh, they will make the right decision. Lincoln always said that about the people. Don't underestimate, underestimate the average American. Lincoln said they had a very good nose, and they could always smell a rotting cadaver in their basement. And so 
we can figure this out, but we got to get the, rather than attacking each other and forming these tribal units and virtue signaling and trying to demolish each other with ad hominem attacks, let's debate the issues one by one and let's come up with the right answers for people. The left has some good ideas, but so does the right, but they both don't have a monopoly on the good ideas. Anthony Scaramucci, thank you so much for joining us. It's always great to be with you. I always enjoy our time. Thank you. Thank you. This is At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll catch you next time.